a dog eat dog world, but in this case, we're talking about snakes. Dozens of snakes were released into the wild in North Florida to eat other invasive snakes. Yeah. Ever get the feeling you're being lied to? Hey everyone, welcome to the channel. Today we're going to look at Florida's invasive reptile problem. I'm going to tell you what I think at the end, but in the meanwhile, I'd like to hear what you think in the comments. Let's dive in. That's pretty hard to fake. Pick it up, Tippy. Okay. <laughs> this is the biggest snake I've ever seen in my whole life. Oh my god, they're so. That's not a highway, so if that's a regular road, I'm guessing it's what, 22, 24 foot wide? And that python was over the halfway mark and going off the road a bit, so I guess 15 foot is, is a totally credible guess. These snakes are doing extremely well in Florida. They're not going to be eradicated anytime soon, and they're reaching this size more regularly than ever before. It is a dog eat dog world, but in this case, we're talking about snakes. Dozens of snakes were released into the wild in North Florida to eat other invasive snakes. Yeah. Here they're talking about this program program to reintroduce the indigo snake into parts of Florida where it has been extirpated and I believe in this case they're actually talking about the panhandle. More snakes. It's a phrase that may make some shudder but local biologists say it's necessary. Working Sounds to good. balance that ecosystem back out by reintroducing the eastern indigo snake. Indigo snake is a large natural predator for a lot of animals in, in the areas where they live. They eat anything that moves in front of them pretty much including birds, small rodents, um, uh, even other snakes, including venomous snakes. So they help to balance the ecosystem. Okay, so the biologist was being reasonable there, telling us the goals and expectations of this program, whereas the news were trying to frame it as the indigo snakes are being released to control invasive species. Some of the publications have gotten carried away and said that they're being released to control the pythons. The biologists aren't saying that because they know it's a separate problem. They know they don't honestly believe that the indigo snake can control the pythons. No one who's serious about herpetology believes that. Move over Burmese pythons, there is a new priority invasive in town. Meet the Argentine black and white tegu. These lizards can reach up to five feet and are rapidly spreading throughout Florida. They have a wide ranging diet, but they're particularly known as egg eaters. These guys have been documented eating American alligators, gopher tortoises, and are of a great concern for our other ground nesting animals, such as our American crocodiles and other sea turtles and birds. It's absolutely true that tegus will harm ground nesting reptiles like crocodiles and gopher tortoises and potentially others as well. They are a large, hardy species. They can withstand frosts as far as I know, but I do also feel that how many of them are present gets a little bit exaggerated because they're diurnal and they're easy to spot. It's a lot easier spotting a tegu or other large lizard that comes out during the day than it is spotting nocturnal snakes for example. Two blind snakes. Look at this. There's actually three under here. I see another one. Look right here. There's another one in here. I can get them out. This might be multiple. No, it's just a bigger one. Brahmini blind snake triple flip. These are invasive, invasive little blind snakes that uh, are one of the smallest snakes in the world. These are fully grown adults. That was NKF Herping. That's an account that I actually promote rather than just commenting on them. I, I do stand behind them. I think they do really good stuff. But the Bramini blind snake is a snake that can reproduce through parthenogenesis. It's an all-female species and it's spread around the world so well that it's got an almost pan-tropical distribution and people often call it the flower pot snake. In Florida though it gets overlooked quite a lot because it's small and seems relatively harmless but it is invasive nonetheless. Now let's move on to the Tyrannosaurus. Only kidding. All right guys, I just want you to see all of these literally probably in the past 30 minutes to an hour have all fallen out of the trees right by the fish and spraying on that. There's actually a couple more on the floor right here. One didn't make it, he's already dead, but it's true. When it gets cold down here in Florida, they literally start dropping from trees. These things can't move if they wanted to. Let's talk about another invasive species, and this time it is the green iguana in southern Florida. Now, like many invasive species, these got popularity through the exotic pet trade in the 1900s. And with southern Florida being quite literally the perfect spot to import exotic animals, they got their popularity there, and pretty quickly. Now let's talk about why they're invasive and why they're a problem. 
Now, the green iguana is primarily an herbivore. Sometimes it'll eat dead birds and bird eggs, but for the most part, it eats vegetation and crops, and it'll actually destroy them. And not only that, but they also have the ability to contract and give salmonella to humans. This is such a problem that they're starting to create bounties for catching these lizards. That seemed pretty reasonable, what he was saying there, aside from the fact that the salmonella problem, I mean, that's really the least of our worries now, unless you're going to go out and lick an iguana, which I think most people probably aren't going to. So check this out. This is a spectacled caiman, an invasive species in South Florida, a non-native crocodilian species. So we just caught this one out here in the Everglades. They're native to Central and South America. And uh, this one's actually missing its arm. You can see right there. It's got a little nub right there. And so they differ from an alligator in a couple of different ways. They're more brown they have this really interesting little tubercle sticking up above the eye and then they also have this bridge between the eyes that is very pronounced so that's where they get the name spectacle caiman like he's wearing a pair of spectacles or glasses um, now they are an invasive crocodilian species the only one that is established in breeding in south florida i'd agree with what he says i think he's broadly correct there that ridge is called the intraorbital ridge it's a good way to identify them but yeah spectacled caimans they've been in florida for quite a while but they're localized, they're not spreading very well, fortunately, right? They need a more year-round tropical climate. They like soft banks and kind of different bodies of fresh water to what you typically find in Florida. And they're also not able to outcompete the larger, more aggressive American alligator. So in Florida, the alligator is still the big kahuna and the caiman aren't gonna take over anytime soon. So today I was lucky enough to find a friend, well, technically a foe, um, this is the invasive Cuban tree frog. The reason that the Giza guys are considered invasive is that they compete for food sources with their other frogs and they actually eat our green tree frogs, which is terrible because I very rarely see green tree frogs around uh, South Florida anymore. Um, to humanely dispatch frogs or any kind of invasive uh, amphibians, you can put them in the freezer um, and they will take the long sleep. However, I love frogs so much, and as much as I want to be an advocate for the environment, I'm going to let this guy go. Definitely research the freezer idea before carrying it out. It is sad. Last time I was in Florida, I was in Collier County, and I didn't see one green tree frog. There were Cuban tree frogs everywhere. The green tree frog is a small, slender, beautiful species native to the area, and they're just dying out, basically. Look at the fucking size of you. You are a damn near gator, buddy. Like a lot of our other invasive species here in Florida, now monitors have been established from the reptile trade. Yeah. Sad but true. There he is. There he is right here. People have pets. They're irresponsible. These animals get big and they're not prepared for what they have to do to take care of them or feed them. And they end up letting them go, releasing them in the wild. Now monitors have become established in a few areas in Florida way down south florida honestly i had expected them to do better because they are just ridiculously tough and the frost line as you know in florida it varies each year and we're being told it's moving further north whether you believe that or not is entirely up to you but it seems that even though they survive frosts in places like south africa they can't handle the continuous damp advective cold that you get during certain winters in florida so what we've got here is a cuban anole he's a little bit mad he's got his mouth open and as beautiful as this creature is, sadly, he's an invasive, which means that he's displacing a lot of the native anoles here in South Florida. As his name suggests, he's come from Cuba. We've pulled him out of a tree. It's a little bit chilly tonight for him. So he's moving a little bit slowly. But what a cool creature and what a great opportunity to get close to them here in the nighttime in South Florida. I've got to admit, it's one of my favorite lizard species. I really enjoyed finding them in Florida, even though I knew they were invasive and they shouldn't be there. In case you're wondering, this is the anole species they often call a night anole. And it does always look like it's got these sunken eyes, like it's a bit sick, but no, they are perfectly healthy. It's just the way they look. That was the northern curly-tailed lizard, originally home to Cuba, Bahamas, and Cayman Islands, I believe. And you can see why people want these as pets. They're cute, they're interactive, 
It's just a shame the way it's panned out in Florida. Also with the curly tail lizard, I've been told they were intentionally released near Palm Beach. I don't know what the full picture is there. If anyone knows, let me know in the comments. What's up guys? Real quick, I wanted to show you the comparison between this full grown male adult veiled chameleon and tiny little babies we have here. Look at that thing. This guy is so solid. One of the heftiest chameleons I've caught. Just not the longest one we found, but man, is he huge. Yeah, he's been eating, so man. thick. <laughs> and then these tiny, tiny little babies. That's where it all starts, right there. Look at that. Failed chameleons are, are quite well established in a few areas now. Again, they're spectacular, beautiful animals. They make amazing pets. Do they belong in Florida, though? Absolutely not. <laughs> Okay, this right here is the red-eared slider turtle. You can tell that by the distinctive red markings on the side of their head. They're absolutely gorgeous, but don't let their looks fool you. This is one of the most invasive species in the entire world. They're actually native to the Midwestern United States, but they're commonly distributed in the pet trade. And when they grow to 10 to 12 inches in length, people often release them in pond ecosystems like this here in Los Angeles, where they outcompete for native wildlife for resources. This specimen right here is a male, which you can tell by the elongated front claws that he uses to grip onto a female when mating. Good info. Obviously he's in LA, but I included that clip because the red-eared slider is just so ridiculously invasive everywhere. There's even populations of it in Florida where people sometimes assume it's just a native species because they have native sliders and cooters everywhere. But it absolutely isn't. It outcompetes native turtles almost everywhere it goes. It pushes them off basking sites, it takes their food. It's a very, again, beautiful pet, but very destructive species if released in the wrong area. Check this out, you guys. This is another species of a lizard that is not from Florida, but they are established here in Florida now. They're actually from Africa. It's called, these guys are called an agama. Really, really cool species of lizard. He was real, real bright when I caught him. His head was real orange and his body's real blue, but he's starting to, you know, become a different color a little bit. They're very, very, very fast. Cash actually found him inside of the patio. So that was my advantage to catch this dude. The girls are just like a brown looking color. They kind of look like your, your normal bearded dragon. But real cool species of lizard right here. They're all over the place in uh, South Florida now. Not much you can really do. Well, he said it. Not much you can really do. They're everywhere. They're small. They're adaptable. Agamas in general are pretty tough. You find them all the way from like Australia to the Mediterranean. And um, they're very versatile. So this guy, lots of people will say, well, why did you release it? But, you know, just catching them is not going to make much of an impact in my opinion. Got him. Heck yeah. He's a big one too. Pretty good sized one. Look at that giant. Look at that. So they use those big old toe pads to grip on to everything. And they got pretty decent sized teeth. You can see the teeth right there too. Strong bite, teeth, sticky pads. These guys are pretty monstrous. You want to know a cool part too is the reason their feet stick is they have those slits in their pads that picks up an electrical charge and allows them to hang on to any surface. Glass, metal, tin, concrete. Yeah, you can see it very well right here. Just with the camera, you can see it. So what he's talking about on the toe pads of the Toke Gecko there are what we call Van der Waals forces, which are a weak electrostatic charge, which actually makes their feet stick to stuff, but only when it's very, very close. So it can't use them to, you know, fly itself across the room, for example, but it can climb almost anything. Again, that's a species that once on the loose, how are you going to go about catching them all? You know, that is an amazingly versatile species with an incredible adaptation to climbing things and, and, you know, and getting out of sight if it wants to. Well, time for me to give my thoughts on this topic. Personally, every time I visit it, I learn more about different invasive species. It seems that there is another one growing in population size every few years. I'm always learning more about how they're spreading, which ones are spreading more or less, and the situation seems to be constantly evolving and it doesn't seem to be looking like it's going to be resolved anytime soon. As a zoologist, I think there will need to be a wide range of attacks on these species, as it were, or programs. I think it's going to take sort of genetics-based sterilization, drones, AI modeling, uh, community efforts, government efforts, all sorts. It's going to take a whole range and a concerted effort to actually eradicate any one of these species. The efforts going on now are incredible, there's people doing incredible work, but to fully eradicate some of these species I think it could take decades and newer technology. Anyway, I hope you found that interesting and I hope you'll be back next week. Thank you very much.